I first became aware of Carrie Solomon and Chuck Konzelman's horror film Nefarious the way a lot of people probably did. By being carpet bombed with pre-roll ads on YouTube. You run a horror channel, you get horror content, I guess. The trailer immediately set off a five alarm spidey sense in me that something was just a bit off. For one thing, it looked like a Blumhouse movie, but without any of the usual Blumhouse suspects. There was a very Conjuring ripoff universe vibe to the trailer. Like one of those films where they wrote it for Travolta, not thinking they could get Travolta, and then they got Travolta, and now, holy shit, we have to make a real movie. Or that End of the Labyrinth one with Dustin Hoffman where he's got no idea what kind of movie he's in. Remind me to do that one one day because there is zero chance that Dustin Hoffman knew what kind of movie that was when he signed up to do it. Anyway, if this is a 2B level movie, why was I seeing ads for it and why was it debuting in theater? Oh, it's one of those. This morning I did an interview with the Robertsons, so I'll be on Unashamed on their podcast here soon. And it was to discuss Nefarious, and, and they were all just blown away by our movie and very complimentary. Consulman and Solomon distributed the film through Soli Deo Gloria Releasing, a distribution company whose only other film is the anti-planned parenthood movie Unplanned from 2019. It's your dad and me. You are our baby from the moment of conception. And its distribution model is loosely based on the God's Not Dead series of drumming up a persecution story that rallies the church-going crowd to support the film as a sort of transgressive act. In fact, Believe Entertainment, the film's production company, also produced the first two God's Not Dead films, and many of the creatives worked on those films as well. It's important to note, though, that nobody on the production seems to think very highly of the actual horror genre. In fact, Steve Deese himself went on a disgusted Twitter rant about theaters showing horror movie trailers prior to the showing of this film, and advised God-fearing filmgoers to show up about 20 minutes late so they could avoid the trailers for Insidious, The Exorcist, and The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Instead, all of the horror trappings and aesthetics that this film wraps itself up in are merely the hamburger into which the pill of Christianity has been mushed so that we, the audience dogs, will take our medicine. Now that, now that we're done tricking, I'm sorry, um, marketing it as a horror film to the Ninevites, we're just going to flat out now be honest about the movie now that it's in theaters. It's a faith-based film. It was always intended to be a faith-based film. We just packaged it in a way to bring people in that are being attracted to darkness. This horror culture misappropriation helps explain why the poster designer uses backwards letters, hoping to convey chaos and malevolence, but it just comes off like a lemonade stand run by the little rascals. For you unwashed heathens, Nefarious is based on a nefarious plot. The first in a series of Christian apologetic horror novels by conservative radio host come conspiracy theorist Steve Deese. Deese is a 2020 election denier and anti-vaxxer based in Iowa, who led the charge to flip the Iowa Supreme Court after the legalization of same-sex marriage. After taking his talk show National, Deese jumped into presidential politics, endorsing Ted Cruz and Mike Huckabee at various points, before eventually falling into line behind Donald Trump like a good little soldier. A huge C.S. Lewis fan, Deese wrote a nefarious plot as a semi-sequel slash tribute to C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters, about a demon instructing his demon protege how to corrupt mankind. And the film Nefarious hues fairly closely to that same idea. Deese himself signs off on the label Christo-Fascist Propaganda for the film, and since the film doesn't even think of itself as a film, a better way to examine it is to cut open the Christo-Fascist Propaganda to see how it works. Thou shalt not be surprised that there beeth spoilers hints. Looking through other reviews of the film, I was unsurprised to read mostly negative opinions on the film and for reasons that, again, are totally predictable. The film is preachy, the characters one note, the acting is... present. Don't get me wrong, all those criticisms are true. The film is basically the Christian apologetics equivalent of Opa Homeless style. The positive reviews were the kind of over-the-top hyperbole you get from bots, paid reviewers, and those who want the film to do well for religious and political reasons. It's reverse review bombing. It's review love bombing. And as a horror film, Nefarious is only passable. Very little of the film is truly scary, but the situation itself is intriguingly horror-centric. It's similar to an infamous episode of The Twilight Zone called The Howling Man, in which a traveler has to decide if the imprisoned man he's talking to is just an innocent man being held by a crazy cult, or if he is, in fact, the devil. Spoiler alert, he chooses wrong. But then, that's exactly what I'd expect from this type of film. Complaining that it's preachy would be like complaining that a Friday the 13th movie had a lot of scantily clad women and violence. 
Like, yeah, I get that you don't like it, but you're not the target audience for that kind of thing, you know? Besides, I can remember being blissfully unbothered by hearing DC talk and Jars of Clay on my alternative radio station in the mid-90s, so it's not as if having a strong, confident system of beliefs is a deal-breaker for me. Just don't go full creed with it. You never want to go full creed with it. So when I finally got the opportunity to see the film, I won't say I was pleasantly surprised. It was more or less what I thought it would be. But I did find myself enjoying the audacity of the film to be about something. As much as conservatives like to complain about Hollywood films like The Hunt, American Horror Story Cult, Werewolves Within, and Ready or Not, these films are mostly notable for the near pathological extent to which they go out of their way to avoid saying anything. Acolytes of Horror has a great video on this phenomenon, link in the description. Honestly, like many college-level composition professors, I'm just glad they were able to articulate a thesis. Briefly, atheist psychiatrist Dr. James Martin is recruited to visit with death row inmate Edward Wayne Brady to confirm that Brady is mentally competent to be executed by the state of Oklahoma. Martin's predecessor died by suicide after first diagnosing the inmate as having dissociative identity disorder, and later coming to believe that he may actually be possessed by a demon. Over the course of the film, Brady vacillates between frightened stammering mess and confident demonic Nefariamus, who taunts James with moral epithets, predictions, and the demon version of Christian theology. Well, how about anything written from the vampire's point of view? The hook is that Nephi knows his Christianity from top to bottom and inside out. He's just on the opposite side of most people who know these things. His goal is to get Martin to write the Dark Gospel, a version of events that will inspire humanity to turn their backs on God. Through the interview, Martin begins to believe that Brady is actually possessed, which puts him in the awkward position of sparing the man and the demon inside him, or letting an innocent man be executed for the crimes of a demon. The film is constructed similarly to Plato's Socratic Dialogues, if Socrates was a methodicted hell fiend who sneered a lot. The drama comes from the characters having a point of view on the existence of God, and how the argument between them unfolds. Our plan is to hurt him, to punish him, and we do that by destroying what he loves, which is you. And there's a helpful ticking clock element to the story that provides some tension as well. Thankfully, the filmmakers know that the two-man show isn't quite enough to carry a 90-minute movie. I mean, this isn't my dinner with Osmodeus. So they occasionally have other characters break in to recontextualize and counterbalance. These include a Pontius Pilate-ish prison director who is cynical enough to want to rush the execution and get the whole damn thing over with, and a prison chaplain who believes, but he does so in the wrong way. Naturally, the side characters are also representations of ideology. Knowing this is a reasonably serious production with at least competent actors, one of whom is going for it the whole time, the thing that will make or break this for the viewer is the rhetorical substance. Just like God's not dead, the problem with the rhetoric, if you can call it a problem, is that the two sides are not presented evenly. In God's Not Dead, a student goes up against a college professor who apparently never took a course in divinity or ethics on his way to getting a PhD in philosophy, and the student remains calm, cool, and collected, making basic Kent Hovine-level arguments while the philosophy professor froths at the mouth in impotent rage. Why don't you admit the truth? You just want to ensnare them in your primitive superstition. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. And everyone clapped. But if you read Nicholas Power's account of getting shellacked in a debate with Hovine, with the audience members becoming even more radicalized by his sophistry, you realize the cartoonishness of the arguments is part of the rhetoric. This is why making bad points, or even good points badly, is not a bug of Deese's apologetics, it's a feature. Like Hovine, every bad point that Deese makes either gets accepted uncritically or invites correction. But the correction itself is seen as defensiveness, and the parlor tricks of a smug liberal atheist. Deese's brand of politics and Christianity, they're the same thing in Deese's world, is based on two things. Number one, a show of force, and number two, persecution. As Umberto Eco pointed out over a quarter century ago, two major tenets of Earth fascist ideology are that the enemy is at the same time too strong and too weak. So we get a blitzkrieg of social media copypasta on Twitter telling us we have to see the film because hashtag Woken Tomatoes gave the film a bad review. And if you want an example of Deese's persecution rhetoric from the production of this very film, I'm going to present without comment a piece of trivia, a second piece of trivia, and then the first piece of trivia again to see if you can rationalize why they might be related. 
The first piece of trivia is that there is a one-day work stoppage due to some accusations of union rule violations. The production company was later slapped with an injunction from the National Labor Relations Board for surveilling and firing a union organizer. The second piece of trivia is that multiple filmmakers, including Chuck Konzelman and Steve Deese, have claimed that the production itself was obstructed by demons. Clearly, Satan didn't want this important film to be made. That's why there were multiple accidents on set and equipment breakdowns, faulty cameras, and the fire alarms were going off at strange, inconvenient times. Things that could only be explained via supernatural means. Returning to that first piece of trivia, the producers of the film were in near constant battle with labor unions. Anyway, Nefarious relies on that transgressive they hate us because they ain't us philosophy to fuel both its narrative and its promotion. Fascists are kind of cool, but not really. So is that like a problem, a thing? First, couching Christian apologetics in the context of a possession film is pretty clever. At first. There is a moment when Dr. James Martin, the film's protect... Well, actually, let me get back to you on that. There's a moment when Dr. James Martin, played by Entourage's Jordan Belfi, opens his arms and dares Nefariamas to take possession of him. Inhabit me. You have my complete, unfettered, and irrevocable permission. Now, in any real-life debate on the existence of God, if an atheist refused to accept the invitation of demonic possession of their body, it would be tantamount to admitting that they harbored doubts about the existence of demons. But in a horror movie? You can't do that shit, dummy! It comes across as the stupidest, most arrogant move since Mika brought home that Ouija board in Paranormal Activity. I promised you I wasn't gonna buy a Ouija board. Oh, I didn't oh, buy a Ouija you board. You exactly what I meant. I borrowed a Ouija board. In fact, I've racked my brain to think of a horror movie in which the skeptic is the hero, or even on the right side of the argument, and I couldn't really think of any. So right away we know that we can't be fully on Martin's side. He's gonna scully himself all the way to a tragic ending based solely on the genre he's in. That would probably be very intimidating if, um, if I weren't an atheist. Probably just a coincidence, Jimmy. So I guess I'm rooting for the demon? As a matter of fact, the genre itself implicates the audience. If an apologist's goals are to A, get people to believe in God, and B, get them to believe that God is good, then setting your apologetics in a horror possession film does the heavy lifting for most viewers. After all, we just got finished calling Martin an idiot for not believing. How are we then going to say that we are non-believers? It works a lot better than Nefariamus' throwaway line about being able to possess Brady because his grandmother brought him a Ouija board when he was eight. I kept waiting for him to reference Dungeons and Dragons, but I was sadly disappointed. Kids like yours, like the ones in your neighborhood, kids who are turning to darkness because society has shut God out. There are, there are seven ogres surrounding you. How could they surround us? I had Morton Titan's magical watchdog cast. No, you didn't. I totally did. You asked me if I wanted any equipment before this adventure, and I said no. But I need material components for all my spells, so I cast Morton Titan's faithful watchdog. But you never actually cast it. Where are the Cheetos? They're right next to you. I cast a spell. Where's the Mountain Dew? In the fridge. And it's not just beliefs about demons, but the right kind of beliefs that are important. As we see when the chaplain arrives. At first, Nefariamus is so shaken that his hair forms demon horns in what is a silly but nice touch. It's goofy, I appreciate it. But you see, the chaplain is a symbolic theologian, not a literalist. He doesn't believe that the Bible is the literal, unerring word of God. He views the stories as general guidelines of philosophy. Sadly, movies and TV have filled our heads with images that are largely metaphorical. Not meant to be taken literally. Upon finding this out, Nefariamus goes back to his taunts, realizing that the chaplain doesn't have any real power behind him. Never let it be said that Solomon and Consulman let anyone off the hook, because God's Not Dead had the same sort of liturgical buckshot for its characters, too. I wish you not to do that. The rest of the film hangs around the premise that Martin is going to commit three murders by the end of the day a premise he self-righteously dismisses. But because this is written by someone who admittedly doesn't care about the rules of honest rhetoric, only theological warfare, Nefariamus gets to define what murder is. Just 10 years ago, you'd been brought up in first-degree murder charges. 
So we learn that Martin signed off on physician-assisted suicide for his ailing mother. That's murder number one, even though James doesn't accept that it qualifies as murder. Nor does the state of Oregon, where it took place. Everything was done according to the law. Oh, the law. Law! The second murder is James allowing his girlfriend to have an abortion. This one is also pretty weak, as Dees, the book, the script, the movie, and interestingly, Nefariamus all agree that everyone secretly knows that abortion is murder. They're just fooling themselves. And when they're called out, as Nefariamus does to James here, people will break down and admit that abortion is indeed murder, as James implicitly does here. This also happens to be the most unintentionally funny sequence of the film, as Sean Patrick Flannery has been playing Nefariamus as a weird, twitchy southerner, like Stone Cold Steve Austin auditioning for an off-Broadway production of Sling Blade. We no longer need him, James. Our work with him is done. And it's time for him to go to hell. And then he suddenly pays tribute to his castmate Willem Dafoe and the Boondock Saints as he screams about the glee the demons in hell feel when a baby is ripped from the womb. Uh, there was a firefight! I can't believe this is the same guy that was in Powder. Honestly, this feels like Razzie bait, which would be par for the course because, as I mentioned, one of Deeson Company's main rhetorical strategies is intentionally screwing the pooch, which invites criticism, and that criticism is then cited as proof that they're being persecuted. And of course, educated liberals just can't resist a good correction to prove their intellectual superiority, so the engagement bait always works. The tweet gets boosted, the movie gets promoted, the audience becomes more polarized. It's quite the little closed-circuit rage-based economy when you think about it. But we still have one more murder, and that's when Edward Wayne Brady decides to choke a bitch, suckering James in before the guards can help him and taunting him with a near-death experience. James is so angry that he signs off on the execution despite knowing that Brady is either under the influence of a demon or actually believes that he is. I'm convinced you actually believe what you're telling me. I cannot morally say that you are sane. It would be murder. Brady is executed in front of a live studio audience, but James already gave Nefariamus permission to possess his body, so he jumps into James, who grabs a conveniently placed gun off a nearby off-duty cop, and goes full-on Bud Dwyer with it. But, like Kevin Sorbo in God's Not Dead, James secretly does believe in God now, so before his possessed hand can pull the trigger, he asks God for help and she delivers. One year later, walking J.T. Walsh character Glenn Beck hosts Martin on his show to talk about a nefarious plot, the book on which this film is based. It turns out Martin did publish Nefariamus' Dark Gospel, but he rewrote it as a warning. No one can explain why the gun didn't fire that day. So it's obvious that not only is God not dead, but willing to intervene in a demonic possession. Just not if you're a poor southerner who's been controlled by a demon since the age of three. He was unbaptized, after all. The important thing, though, is that James learned a valuable lesson about faith, good and evil, and not poking the bear. And that's essentially the Christian apologetics monomyth, at least since God's not dead. A smug atheist refuses to admit they believe, shit goes down, the atheist finds God. The underlying premise that all atheists are secretly believers, they're just showing off for their atheist friends, is the fuel that runs most of these movies. Given that, there are basically three takes that this film is going to generate. The first is what largely happened in the online horror and critic community, and that is full dismissal of the film. Any horror that the film produces is on the same level of those Christian alternative haunted houses, where instead of taking you into the serial killer's house, it's an abortion clinic. What do we have here? Her name is Jan, she's 17 years old. She took the new abortion pill, RU486, two days ago. She's been bleeding ever since this morning, complains of severe abdominal cramps, and her blood pressure is 80 over 60. Uh, why won't the bleeding stop? Matt said this wouldn't be a big deal, it was just a stupid or they have people screaming from hell because they danced to the thong song before they got married. So Jess, how are you liking your first grade? The second take is that of a dog whistle to the already believing Christian audience. These are the people who bot tweeted the movie into trending status on Twitter. It's a reassurance that evangelicals are right, and that self-important atheists are gonna get theirs in the end. And Dark Brandon won't be able to do anything about it. Just you wait and see. For some people, seeing an atheist get run over or watching them nearly blow their big boy brains out is a comfort watch. And the final take is by far the most outlandish. 
And that's that there really will be converts after seeing this film. People who go in thinking they're going to be watching an Insidious-style movie only to realize that they too once played with a Ouija board. And now they have to go down the Parker Brothers to Procter & Gamble conspiracy rabbit hole. Actually, I've seen that TikTok rabbit hole. Maybe it's not so outlandish. But that leads to the biggest problem I have with the film, and that's that the rhetoric is self-defeating. In their haste to couch an apologetics movie inside of a horror premise, the filmmakers forgot that the precepts of the horror genre negate a lot of what they're going to try to accomplish. First of all, it's hard to think of James as the protagonist. Yes, he gets an arc. Yes, he has a character-defining decision to make. But he's also real-world smart and horror movie dumb. The filmmakers have a general disdain for the educated, so that's not surprising. But Martin's role and professional ethics necessitate him taking the actions he does. In the real world, the last thing you'd want to do is feed into the delusions of someone claiming to be possessed. That's not him being egotistical, that's just him being good at his job. But in the context of a horror film, Martin is frustratingly obtuse. And I can't explain how a professional magician does his tricks either, but that doesn't make them real. And the filmmakers would say, good, the smart aleck atheist learning his lesson at the end is the point. But the problem with that is that in a regular old horror film, rooting against the protagonist is fine because it's just escapism. People root for Ghostface or Jason or Freddy and then they go out and they buy the merch and they do cosplay and they display their fandom of the villain, of the killer. That doesn't serve the same purpose here. This really becomes apparent when you compare it to the ending of God's Not Dead. The idea is that getting hit by the car is actually a miracle because it forced Professor Beefcake into converting and saving his soul at the end. But in Nefarious, the speeding car is actually a thousand-year-old demon. Did the filmmakers really want me to root for Nefariamus? Because that's what happened. And it happened because it really feels like the filmmakers are catching this battle of good versus evil as God and demons teaming up to fight atheists. The stated battle isn't for Dr. James Martin's soul, it's for his belief. And both God and Nefariamus are on the same side on that one. Why is it so important that I think you're evil? Add to that Nefariamus being all over the place in judgment of humans. Imagine the joy in your little Cinderella's heart when she realizes she's butchered the baby in her belly for nothing. And that's because he's the mouthpiece for Dees, not the antagonist. And Dees isn't an experienced enough author to be able to displace himself. That's why James Martin is a hollow stereotype of an atheist. And Nefariamus comes off like the only one in the movie who knows what's up. So sometimes Nefariamus will sneer in judgment of the human race for American literacy rates, even though James is right. Literacy is at an all-time high. Nephi retorts with a statistic about American reading levels. James, the average high school graduate reads at a sixth grade level. But Martin's point was about improvement. The global literacy rate was only 20% a century ago. Now it's nearly 90%. But more than that, I don't know what Nefariamus' position on literacy even is. Is he for it? Is he against it? You'd think he'd be against it because one of the Protestant precepts was that everybody needed to be literate in order to read their Bible. But low literacy rates also correlate strongly with religiosity, at least in the United States. So maybe he does want people to read. It just seems like this scene wants to be religious Aaron Sorkin, but with Sorkin you at least know what everyone's position is. Eh, maybe he's just trolling. But it happens repeatedly. And the worst example is when he guilts James for allowing his girlfriend to have an abortion. According to Nefariamus, the demons in hell throw a rager every time a pregnancy is terminated. Yet everything he says and does explicitly states that James should feel bad about this and that he should try to stop it. If an abortion is such an excuse for a diabolical shindig, why wouldn't he encourage James instead of condemning him? Why not commend him for his views on freedom if those views are what are damning humanity? The answer is because Nefariamus is a thinly veiled Steve Deese. In listening to his show or reading his Twitter feed, you can see a barely restrained contempt for modern American society. He hates that there are gay people. He hates that there are trans people. He thinks Muslims are inherently dictatorial. He hates that there are scientists, both climate and virologists. But most tellingly, he hates the abstract contemporary American for not having more of a problem with these things. And so does Nefariamus who comes across more like a Calvinist preacher than a demon hell-bent on corrupting the innocent. You could make your life about sacrificial love, and you could play live-in therapist for the rest of your life. But that brings up the harshest fatal plot error, and that's the fact that Nefariamus would have been successful had he just not convinced James he exists. We tell you 
exactly what it is that we'd like you to do. You want me to write your book, right? If Nefariamus' want in this film is to get James to publish his dark gospel, he would have been much better served convincing James he was mentally ill. Or at least a phony trying to avoid death row who concocted an elaborate dissociative ruse. If the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is convincing the world he doesn't exist, then the stupidest thing Nefariamus does is spend this entire movie trying to convince James that he does exist. Nefariamus even tells him several times that disbelief is empowering. I didn't know this was a fight. That's why you're losing. Think about it. James is an ambitious psychiatrist with impressive credentials. And if he can get a book deal, which Nefariamus assumes he can, wouldn't he be more likely to publish the gospel as part of a case study on mental illness? This is a guy who has big plans. That's why his girlfriend's getting the abobo. There's no way he doesn't spread the gospel to the world, thinking he's just educating the general public on dissociative identity disorder. As much as Deese in the film hates smug liberals, it's Deese's own self-satisfied arrogance that winds up torpedoing the film and giving it the opposite interpretation for non-believers and normies than Deese intended. Am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. It's also unfortunate, because this is a film that sacrifices the idea of being a straight-up movie in favor of leaning into the audacity of having something to say. But the thing that it says is so clumsy and fumbling that only the people who don't want to look at it critically will come away with anything of value. Stay warm, stay safe, live your life like a goose with a knife, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time.